Hi, this is the Tropical Tip for Friday evening, September 11th. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office for the best information for your location. We still have an active Atlantic. We have a brand new Tropical Depression 19 that has formed near the Western Bahamas. We have Tropical Storm Paulette that will be a significant threat to Bermuda here uh, once we get past the weekend. We have Tropical Storm Renee, which has been weakened today by cooler water and wind shear, and we're not going to discuss that one too much as it's not expected to be a threat to land. And we have a new tropical wave southwest of the Cabo Verde Islands that will develop into a storm in all likelihood as it comes west across the central Atlantic during the next several days. So we'll talk about these three storms, not so much Renee, as that's not expected to be a threat. We're going to start off with Tropical Depression 19 to the east of South Florida here. If we take a zoomed in view of the satellite picture, we'll see that compared to the last couple of days, this area of convection that we've been watching has been persistent enough to start having an impact on the surface wind field, and a surface circulation has indeed formed. We can see this on the visible satellite by noting that there is east or east southeast wind off of West Palm Beach and then we have north or northeast wind near Miami and then we have west wind in the Florida Straits and southwest wind coming off of Cuba. So we do in fact have a surface low that has formed somewhere between Miami and Andros Island. It's hard to tell exactly where and that's because we've had most of the thunderstorm activity on the southeast side and some mid-level rotation has become quite pronounced there on radar imagery. This is from Mark Nissenbaum's FSU site, and we can see that there's pronounced rotation at the mid-levels of the atmosphere just off of Andros Island. The surface low position best estimate is a little bit more toward the northwest here, but we do have the mid-level center to its southeast. And considering that TD-19 is still rather weak, it is prone to the surface low relocating, so we might see this low move underneath of the mid-level center at some point tonight. And if that happens, it will delay somewhat its arrival in South Florida and possibly push it off slightly to the south. Right now it is expected to eventually come west northwestward across the southern part of the state or the Florida Keys down here. And uh, either way, uh, heavy rains, gusty winds going to be the story across a wide swath of South Florida. We have had some strong winds reported on the northeast side of the circulation where a ship here has reported a wind of about 35 miles per hour a couple of times during the last couple of hours. And there is a tropical storm watch up for this section of Florida coastline. Uh, where winds up to about 40 miles per hour will be possible in some of these thunderstorms overnight tonight and tomorrow as the system moves through. It's not in a big hurry and it will be moving fairly slowly. Some heavy rains are possible as it moves through. If we look at the water vapor satellite picture, we'll see that there is a bit of an upper trough to the northwest of the depression. We have some northwest wind here aloft and some southwest wind north of the Bahamas outlining this upper level trough that's kind of centered off of South Carolina. Now this trough may be partially responsible for why TD-19's surface low is a little bit uh, on the west side of most of the convective activity, just a light touch of northwesterly shear. But this is not expected to last very long as this trough is rather weak and easily nudged aside and weakened by persistent thunderstorm activity associated with the storm. And shear is generally expected to be pretty low on the order of 10 knots or less as this moves into the Gulf of Mexico over the coming days. Now if you look at some of the modeling for this, it's important to realize that the GFS, Euro, and others have not really expected TD-19 to exist yet, and indeed models did not really expect a storm to develop at all uh, as recently as yesterday. Uh, but if we look at the GFS, we can get some insight into uh, what will be governing the future of TD-19 here. This is the mid-level relative humidity and flow plot showing this big area of rainfall that we're seeing on satellite and radar and the mid-level low here. This is going to continue westward, and on the model you'll see that by the time we get this into the Gulf, we have kind of a surface low show up, but it's on the west side. So we still have a little bit of a tilt here with the mid-level low on the eastern side on the GFS. And this kind of persists as uh, we go forward in time with the surface low remaining on the southwest side of the deep greens here, indicating where the thunderstorms would be on the model. And uh, it's important to realize again that this storm is likely too weak in the model. Considering the organizational trends that we have right now, I would expect TD-19 
to be stronger than is depicted on the GFS here and possibly better vertically aligned than is shown on the model. But as it stands on the GFS, the storm stays rather weak due to this as it comes northward. And the reason it's coming northward is because if we look at the 500 millibar plot here, there's initially a strong ridge over the southeastern U.S. directing traffic toward the west, but this is going to scoot off toward the east during the next couple of days. So during the weekend, we end up with the ridge more out over the Atlantic by Sunday, and this starts to direct the flow more out of the south. And so we're expecting the tropical depression to come west and then turn more into the northeastern Gulf of Mexico. At that point, where it goes will depend much on how strong it is and also the details of the steering flow. A weaker storm, such as depicted on the GFS, would likely follow the low-level flow more toward the west and toward Louisiana. A stronger storm would probably be more likely to move north into the Florida panhandle here. But all of this will be happening pretty slowly, because if we go forward here, what we realize is happening is once this ridge leaves over the Atlantic, the trough behind that ridge is only only extending down toward the Tennessee Valley, if that. And what's left behind is a region of pretty light steering flow over the Gulf of Mexico. There's nothing pushing this anywhere very quickly. And so while it might be close to the coastline, uh, by the time we get past the weekend, it may only slowly move ashore. And so we'll be talking about the potential for heavy rainfall over a prolonged period of time, and also uncertainty in exactly where it crosses the coastline. If we look at the GFS upper level uh, flow during this entire evolution, we see that while it's over the Gulf, we really don't see a lot of shear here. It's a pretty light environment with, a, with an upper level ridge over the Gulf. Tiny little upper trough to its north might be the reason why the GFS shows a tilted vortex. But again, if TD19 is stronger than currently expected on the model, this is unlikely to be a significant issue, at least it would seem. Now, as this nears the coastline, again, it slows down and you can see it starts to drift toward the west-northwest and we start to get a little bit of westerly flow aloft. And it's possible that a weaker storm would uh, be susceptible to some of this shear that is occurring, but it's not very strong shear and it is possible that this is a much stronger storm than currently shown on the GFS. So again, significant impediments before landfall don't seem particularly likely. If we look at the GFS, or sorry, the official forecast from the National Hurricane Center, uh, we see this generally westward track that then slows down as we talked about in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico. And so this could bring it uh, you know, close to Florida as soon as Sunday afternoon or toward Louisiana as late as Tuesday afternoon. So you can see the uncertainty here with where this is going to be and how slowly it's moving. So do be prepared for potential impacts as soon as Sunday along the Northeast Gulf Coast. A lot of the rain is likely to be on the right hand side here. So do expect heavy rainfall in the Florida Panhandle regardless of the exact track. And then the potential for uh, impacts from rain and wind even farther west, as far west as Louisiana as we get beyond the weekend. Uh, the NHC currently expects this to have max winds of about 70 miles per hour near hurricane strength when it nears the coastline, and uh, the exact intensity here will depend on how it gets together over the next couple of days. If it remains kind of tilted and not vertically aligned, it'll be slower to intensify, but if we get it to stack vertically, then we could see a pretty healthy cyclone by the time it gets into this part of the Gulf of Mexico, and a hurricane is certainly on the table in terms of the realm of possibility. Just be prepared and have a plan in place in case something comes your way in a couple days. For South Florida, this is mostly a rain event with some gusty winds up to 40 miles per hour possible, but mostly rainfall overnight tonight and tomorrow morning. Okay, so that was Tropical Depression 19. We'll be talking about that for a few days. We also have Tropical Storm Paulette out in the middle of the Atlantic, and this is a potentially significant threat to Bermuda, which is right here. If we look at the close-up view, we're going to see that Paulette uh, continues to be sheared, and you'll see that the low-level center is located here to the south of most of the main thunderstorms, but the shear is likely going to change soon. If we look at the water vapor satellite picture, we can see what's causing the shear, this large rotation in the upper and mid-levels. Big upper-level low here is generating southerly wind, which is shearing Paulette out of that direction. But we can also see that Paulette is starting to nose its outflow uh, into that trough, and this is starting to cut off into a fully uh, cut off low with this part of the trough being eroded as Paulette now starts to pivot around this low. 
and it's actually more to the left like this. Bermuda's over here. It's going to end up in the vicinity of Bermuda in a couple of days. And as it pivots around this uh, upper level low, shear will decrease markedly tonight, tomorrow, and beyond. And we're expecting that Paulette will face more favorable conditions for intensification over the next couple of days. And given that it is still a very well-defined vortex today, as soon as the shear lets off, it's likely to intensify almost immediately when that uh, hostile shear relaxes. If we look at the GFS, we can see this happen. There's Paulette. Here's the upper level low in orange connected to this large upper level trough. And you can see that it's about to pinch off and we will eventually here get uh, a cutoff upper low to the southwest of Paulette, which again lowers the shear because the upper level flow weakens and is now out of the southeasterly direction. There's Bermuda right here, and this is going to pivot Paulette around very close to Bermuda before turning toward the right. We have this big ridge over New England that's propagating eastward, and that's going to help steer Paulette toward the left, and then after that ridge goes by, Paulette will be able to turn around the west side and recurve. Whether that happens right over Bermuda or just to the left or to the right of Bermuda remains to be seen, but it is going to be a close call. We can see that on the GFS, it goes just to the west of the island, and it's also a very strong hurricane at that time around Monday afternoon. We can look at the H wharf as well, which shows the storm passing just east of the island of Bermuda, which is right here, as again, a strong hurricane. And the Euro is also just to the west, and we just saw the GFS is also to the west. And with the H wharf to the east, you can see that there's a, a model consensus that is very close to the island. And uh, it's hard to pinpoint. We can't tell you if it's going to be a direct hit on this tiny island, but it is going to be close and significant impacts are likely. This is the official forecast from the NHC showing that little leftward bend as it pivots around the upper level low and then turning around the ridge right close to the island of Bermuda just to the west on this forecast as a strong hurricane and then continuing northeastward into the open Atlantic. Uh, exactly how strong this gets remains to be seen. The official forecast shows winds of about 110 miles per hour at a maximum as it reaches its closest approach to Bermuda. That's a Category 2 hurricane, but a Category 3 is definitely not out of the question as we do have favorable conditions for two full days prior to landfall, and we could see rapid intensification of Paulette prior to approaching the island. And this is likely to be very close, if not over the island, so do have a plan and preparations in place for a direct hit from a strong hurricane. Watches and warnings will likely be out sometime tomorrow from the NHC for Bermuda. So do be safe if you're living there on the island. We're now going to switch gears to the wave that's coming in behind that just left Africa and is continuing westward across the central Atlantic. This is the large wave that has been an uncertain forecast in most of the modeling, and that's because it's part of a very large belt of monsoonal vorticity here where we have westerly winds on the south side, easterly winds on the north side, and we have multiple areas of concentrated spin or vorticity within here. We have one area of mid-level rotation on the western side, and we have one on the eastern side, and we've had little things going on in the middle at times as well. These situations are notoriously difficult to predict uh, because it is difficult to tell exactly how quickly each little area will move toward the west, considering that we have belts of flow out of opposite directions to the north and south, and it's difficult to tell how they will interact with each other. How is this one going to be influenced by the stuff going on to its east? That's very difficult for models to grasp. But the general trend over the last couple of days has been toward focusing on this left-hand side. This one is expected to become the primary storm, with possibly a secondary storm forming and going north afterwards. And this is now an agreement that the GFS and Euro have come to. If we look at the 850 millibar vorticity forecast, which shows our wave here, you can see the elongated region of rotation. This is the western side that is expected to take over and become dominant as it moves across the Atlantic. And we can see it develop into a storm on Monday on the model. And then some sort of second storm is maybe trying to form to the northeast. And as we go forward by Tuesday, we can see that we have a storm located in the central Atlantic on the GFS. And now on the European model, we also have a storm in the same location. And finally, the two models have come into agreement after disagreeing for a couple of days in a row on this wave. What happens after this 
still has a degree of uncertainty and that's because uh, there's a lot of sensitivity to how quickly uh, this comes westward. This is tagged 95L by the way, so we'll just call it 95L. Uh, this is going to face a crossroads uh, of whether it turns north or continues westward. And this is largely dependent on what happens after Paul Lett leaves the scene and moves northward. Because if we look at the 500 millibar pattern here on the Euro, this is valid for Wednesday morning. We have a storm that has been moving westward up to this point. Now what ends up happening is the ridge that's left behind once Paul Lett leaves is fairly weak and we have this upper low to the northeast and there's not a very strong westerly steering current trying to drive this into the Caribbean if it's located where it is on the model right here. If it's a little faster than the model currently shows, say it's closer to the Lesser Antilles on Wednesday, then it's closer to the nose of this ridge and so it gets shunted west a little bit more and so it ends up being a direct threat to the Lesser Antilles and perhaps beyond. However, uh, once we go forward, even a couple of days, even if that happens, uh, we end up having Paulette leaving and what's left behind is a very anemic uh, steering flow over the entirety of the subtropical western Atlantic. There's not a very strong ridge here. There is a ridge, but it's very weak and the steering flow is not very strong. And to drive the hurricane right into the islands, you need a strong flow toward the west. We don't have that here, and so what happens is the strengthening storm starts drifting northwestward, which is what hurricanes tend to do. It's called beta drift, and it really just starts to turn here into this weak, this weakness in the ridge, and northward is where it goes. And on the model, this takes it out into the middle of the ocean, away from land. Now again, it's possible still that this storm moves slower or faster than is currently forecast. And if we look at the ensemble from the European members, you can ignore everything up here. This is other storms. But here is the envelope of solutions for this wave that we're talking about. And we have one group that turns northward that we see here. This is the main group and currently the most likely solution I would say at this time is that the storm is slow enough that it's able to turn north before it reaches the Lesser Antilles. But we have another group of ensemble members that's still there, uh, indicating that if the storm moves faster, it is able to get into the Lesser Antilles prior to turning north anywhere. And this is still technically on the table and still a possibility. Remember that when we're dealing with a storm as broad as this, we really don't know anything for sure until it consolidates and gets its act together. We've seen time and again that models struggle with elongated strung out systems like this. So we really need to wait until we have a storm to really have a good feel for whether the islands could be threatened. But right now, keep it on your radar. It is technically possible that this nears the Lesser Antilles in several days, but we do have several days to watch it. So it's not an imminent threat at the moment. All right, well, that is the complete survey of all the systems in the Atlantic. We didn't really talk about Rene, but that, that's not expected to be a threat to land. We'll keep an eye on Tropical Depression 19, likely to become Tropical Storm Sally in the Gulf of Mexico, potentially a hurricane threat, so do keep a plan in place uh, just in case it happens to come your way as a threatening storm. We have Paulette expected to be a very significant threat to the island of Bermuda, and if a direct hit occurs, it could be as a strong hurricane, so do have preparations. Uh, going there, you have a couple of days left before impacts arrive, so do stay safe on the island, and uh, we'll continue to watch this wave, not yet getting its act together, but expected to in a couple of days, and we'll likely have a brand new storm. Its name would be Teddy if this one gets named Sally prior to that point. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.